Welcome to Mount Sinai Live. We stream smart healthcare information that's simple to understand so you can improve your health. I'm physical therapist, Dr. Drew McKay, and I'm your host. Today, we're talking about multiple myeloma. Audience, remember, if you have questions or comments during the live stream, feel free to drop in the comments below, no matter what platform you're watching from. To make sure you know more about multiple myeloma is an associate professor of medicine and clinical director of multiple myeloma at the Mount Sinai Hospital, Dr. Cesar Rodriguez. Dr. Rodriguez, welcome to Mount Sinai Live. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's get into multiple myeloma so the audience can learn more. We'll start off with something I'm sure you get asked a lot, symptoms. What are the common symptoms associated with multiple myeloma? Uh, some common symptoms of multiple myeloma are very vague, unfortunately. So um, bone pain, back pain, fatigue, weight loss, um, foaming urine are some of the most common symptoms that are that can be attributed to multiple myeloma. And as you can see, those symptoms can happen uh, with almost many diseases. So yeah. it's kind of hard to pinpoint a symptom that's specific for myeloma. Right. Since those are so vague, let's talk about diagnosis then. How is multiple myeloma diagnosed? Um, the majority of the time, multiple myeloma tends to be diagnosed uh, trivially because somebody's getting a CT scan or an X-ray after an accident or because they fell. And then on the imaging studies, they find a lesion uh, in bones or a small tumor. Other times it can be identified when you go have your annual checkup with your primary care doctor and you have anemia or you have kidney damage or renal failure, or uh, you're complaining of significant uh, back pain or some type of bone pain that doesn't get alleviated with time and imaging studies show a lesion. So in order to make a diagnosis of myeloma, we normally uh, either identify renal failure, anemia, uh, bone lesions or bone fractures, um, high calcium in the blood. Uh, those are the, the most common uh, ways of diagnosing it. But ideally, when we make a diagnosis, we have to do a full workup. Uh, and when we're suspecting it, we do a bone marrow biopsy. Um, so it's lab work, imaging studies to look for lesions or tumors, a bone marrow biopsy to look for cancer cells uh, that are multiple myeloma. And uh, that's it. Uh, let's talk stages. What are the stages of multiple my myeloma? I'm sure you get this question often. Yes, this is a pretty tricky question because a lot of the times when we think of cancer, we think of stages and we think of stage one, two, three, four, and the higher number you are, the, the poor prognosis are less likely to cure or treat. But myeloma is a blood cancer. So if you have it, you have it all over the body. So the staging system for myeloma is trickier in the sense that it doesn't tell you how extensive it is throughout the body. It just tells you how more aggressive or advanced it is. And we have stage one, two, and three. But for practical purposes, I just want people to understand that staging is more for research purposes, and it doesn't really tell a patient if it's caught early on or if it's caught late uh, in the disease. You mentioned treatment there a second ago. What are the treatment options available now for multiple myeloma? Well, fortunately, we've had a lot of new drugs come out in the last 15 years. Uh, treatment could be a series of things. It, Radiation to a localized area or a localized tumor would be, could be one option. Systemic chemotherapy uh, could be another option. Normally, when we talk about systemic chemotherapy, we talk about combination of drugs. And then lately, we're using uh, not necessarily chemotherapy, but immunotherapy, which is using your immune system to help um, attack the, the cancer itself. Stem cell transplant, cell therapy are other ways of actually um, treating this disease. And in very few cases, uh, whenever we do have one single lesion, we could do surgical resection. I'm sure if people hear the words multiple myeloma, the, the, the next question is, can this be cured? So when you get that question, how do you respond? Uh, well, at the moment, we can't use the word cure for multiple myeloma. Fortunately, with all these new drugs that have come out, the it's much better controlled. And it has become more... Um, chronic disease, almost like a diabetes, that you have diabetes, whenever it's out of control, you might need several medications and insulin and diet. Once it's controlled, you can scale back on your treatment and have a normal life. But whenever it gets out of control again, because of an infection or overeating or something, you have to go back on therapy to try to control it. And just this game of being on and off uh, therapy to control it. That's how myeloma is handled nowadays. But unfortunately, we still don't have a cure. Hopefully in the near future with all the new therapy that we're uh, working on, on clinical trials, we might reach that point. 
Heredity comes into play with certain conditions. Is, is multiple myeloma, is it hereditary? Uh, not really, to be honest. There's a very, very small percentage that has been associated with a familial, uh, myeloma or hereditary myeloma. This percentage is very, very negligible. So I don't want people to, to be misled by this uh, statement and think that if you have multiple myeloma, it's something that you're going to inherit to or to your kids or to your grandkids. There's always a higher predisposition to cancer uh, um, if one of your parents or grandparents or family members has cancer, but there really is no uh, no true tie at this point. Okay. Let's talk about a comparison. How is multiple myeloma different from leukemia? That's a great question. So when we talk about cancers, we talk about solid uh, tumors and we talk about liquid tumors or liquid cancers. And there's three types of main types of liquid cancers, uh, leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. And I would say the main differences between leukemia and multiple myeloma is where this cancer originates from. In leukemia, it originates from blasts, which is a type of white cell. In multiple myeloma, it originates from plasma cells, which is also a type of white cells. So they both come from white cells, just different type of white cells within the family of white cells. And leukemias come in many uh, flavors. Some of them are very quick and can potentially kill you within a month if you don't get treated. Others are very chronic that you can live with for the rest of your life without requiring therapy. And in myeloma, we also have a little bit of variety in the sense that there are some that are a bit more aggressive than others, but it doesn't uh, present as acutely as a leukemia. You could um, actually afford to wait several weeks to do the full workup before starting therapy without compromising that patient's health. This is more a slower growing, and a lot of the times, by the time we diagnose it's been in somebody's body for uh, months, uh, if not even more than a year. Uh, annual testing. If someone's listening to this right now, are there any annual tests patients should take, patients should ask their doctors about that may show early signs of multiple myeloma? There's no actual screening study for multiple myeloma, just like there is screening for colon cancer or mammograms for breast cancer. But the important thing to keep in mind is that even though there is no screening for multiple myeloma, Having an annual exam with your primary care doctor and have a physical exam and laboratory tests can actually identify early signs of a potential uh, multiple myeloma or precursors of multiple myeloma. So even though there isn't a screening, I do recommend that you guys uh, go for your annual physical exam and maybe we could diagnose it at an earlier stage. Let's talk about demographics for the last question. Uh, race, does race affect outcome? in instances of multiple myeloma? Um, so multiple myeloma tends to affect men more than women, tends to affect people in their late 60s. Uh, um, it tends to affect men, uh, black men more than uh, Caucasians. And uh, sadly, um, people, black patients or, or patients uh, from Afri African-American um, descent are, less likely to get treated and to receive clinical trials and receive stem cell transplants that could actually make a huge impact in terms of the outcomes of this disease compared to any other race. And the thing that's even sadder is that in studies that we have done where we compare um, survival throughout the races and ethnicities, if they actually have access to the same treatment, we see that the the black community and African-American descent tend to actually do better if they do have access to the treatment. So that's something that is alarming because uh, right now on our day to day, we do see that African-American population tends to have a poorer prognosis, but if they actually had access to the treatment, it would be the opposite. Tatra Rodriguez, thanks so much for the insight. You can find us at Mount Sinai NYC on all major social platforms. This has been another Mount Sinai Live broadcast. We stream smart healthcare information that's simple to understand so you can improve your health. I'm physical therapist, Dr. Truman McKay. Thanks for watching.